Have you ever noticed that construction workers and demolition workers look the same, but they do something really different? They have the same (laughs) helmet, the same orange, green, reflective vest, the same mustache, usually. No, I don't know about that. But they look the same. They even use a lot of the same tools. Not all the same tools. I've never seen like a, build, a house building company use a wrecking ball to put a roof on a house, but some builder in here might be like, challenge accepted, going to do it this week. But use a lot of the same tools, a lot of the same gear. And if you were to drive by one, you might think they're the same. I think that type of illusion exists in the church often. Church people kind of look similar. We show up to the same thing. We sing the same songs off a screen. We say a lot of the same things, we get involved in a lot of things, we have a lot of the same routines, a lot of the same kind of like shared behavioral values or whatever. We do things similarly. Now, you're like, Ryan, we do not all look the same. And you're looking at me and you're like, don't offend me by saying I look anything like you, Ryan. But we kind of model a certain type of lifestyle or behavior in general that's somewhat similar. But I would argue that within the context of the church, the global community of faith, there is a vast array of what people invest into and insert into the church, much like demolition workers and construction workers. Think about how different those two jobs are, even though dressing the same, going to some of the same places, using many of the same tools. Like they literally are doing the opposite thing, right? You know, it's like, if there was a superhero that was like construction man or construction woman or Mrs. Carpentry or whatever, uh, their arch villain would be demolition man or demolition woman or whatever. They're doing the same thing. They're tearing down what the other is building up. We're going to look at this text this morning. And I think really there's this like understanding in the kingdom of Jesus that we all have this opportunity to like build up and invest into the kingdom of Jesus, into his global community. But we also are very well equipped as humans struggling with like our own sinful inclinations to be people who chip away at and cause damage and break things down. And I think there's a conflict within all of us. And when I put it into those terms, none of us are like, oh, yeah, I just feel like a full-time demolition worker in the church. But there's this conflict, I think, that brews within all of us that's like, you know, these inclinations that sometimes pull us where we can believe maybe we're doing good or think a certain way, and it can actually be a negative investment into the church. And I hope that as we lean into this text this morning that um, we'll be able to maybe ask ourselves and ponder, you know, what is it that I am doing? Am I more like a builder or am I more like a destroyer? How am I investing in the different areas of my life? I wasn't here last week, but thankfully it's 2024 and the internet exists. So I got to hear uh, a really wonderful message by... Josh, and I don't just say that because he's sitting here. If he's out of the room, I would say it as well. But a wonderful message. And I loved, um, I just love this picture of like leaning into like all of what scripture is and this focus on the preacher on the mount. I mentioned this before, but uh, Josh is the one that thought the subtitle should be the preacher on the mount rather than the sermon on the mount, which I thought that was a really neat kind of change because less so what we're doing is trying to like say, oh, what did Jesus say, but more say, who is he? Who is he? And how do I be more like him? Not just how do I do all the things, but how do I be more like him? Josh's text last week uh, was Jesus kind of opening up. If if it was like a church, it'd be like a seven week mini series. You know, churches do series. We've got some artwork and stuff like that, but it'd be this series kind of going through the Old Testament law. And uh, I love that text last week. And Jesus kind of opens it up, opens it up and says, this is what my kingdom is like. This is what kingdom life is like. So now let's dig into the Old Testament text and work through some things. I'm going to read the whole passage, Matthew 5, 21 to 26, and then we'll hop back to start and work through it. Jesus says this, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Any, again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. 
Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. It's always interesting in these passages, we always have this like really nice, fluffy, happy picture of Jesus, but he ends so many of these sections with such like, on such a downer note, we're like, oh my goodness, like, you know, I I feel like I should start ending my sermons like that. It's like, you are headed to destruction. Have a great week, guys. I'll see you at the Pollock. No, <laughs> let's work through this a bit. I want to share a few thoughts. At the end, I have kind of like two mantras that I glean from this in my life, and I'll share them with you, and hopefully it'll be helpful. Jesus starts out, he says, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago. Now, over the next several weeks, as we dig into these passages, um, kind of after the text Josh had last week, Jesus is going to use this language over and over. It has been said. You've heard that it was said. You've heard that it was said. You've heard that it was said. I think there are a couple things going on here. One, he's digging into the Old Testament. He's saying, you've heard that it was said. But I also think that Jesus sometimes is a little bit sarcastic or cheeky. A couple of reasons I think that. One, because of how I read the Bible. But two, I'm hoping he is because then I'm just a little bit more like Jesus because I'm a very sarcastic person. But when he says, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, and he's going to say something, then he's always going to turn around and he says, but I tell you. What he's actually saying is, you've heard this, but have you really heard it? People who are married experience this all the time, right? Dudes? We hear our wives talk, but do we really hear what they say? You know? It's like, hey, can I go to this thing? Yeah, sure, fine. We're like, oh, sweet. She said, great. Uh, Right? We do that. Jesus is, I think, making a sarcastic statement. He's like, you've heard this, but I don't know if you really heard it. I don't know if you really got it, bro. So let me tell you what it's about. You've heard that was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. That's true. That's an Old Testament commandment. And anyone who murders will be subject to to judgment. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Now, I want to clarify something here as, before we move on. Um, this word for murder, sometimes people, you know, in the Bible, the words murder and kill kind of go back and forth and all that. Most scholars would suggest, suggest that what Jesus is talking about here, and you can read, if you read through the Old Testament, you'll see like all these quite expansive provisions. It's like if you accidentally kill someone, or if there's like a workplace incident, or like your animal kills, there are all these examples. But there's what we call first-degree murder that's described in the Old Testament, not called first-degree murder, but a malicious type of murder. And this is what most scholars would say Jesus is talking about here. He's not talking about like, whoops, like you got in a car crash or something like that. He's saying first-degree, like premeditated, hate-filled murder. Anyone who does that will be subject to judgment. That's not to excuse the other kinds, but Jesus is using heightened language here. He's talking about a very extreme act. So he says, you've heard that. People will be subject to judgment if they commit murder. He says, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. That's pretty tough, right? Brother and sister there doesn't actually mean like just your siblings. If it did, that's especially tough. Anybody with (laughs) siblings in the room? But Jesus is saying, if you're angry with those around you, you're going to be subject to judgment. And it's a parallel to murder. Oh, Those are really deflating words. Like, let's go back to blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted, right? Like, at that point in the sermon, I'm like, oh, yes, sweet. Like, I've mourned. I want to be comforted. Jesus says, if you're ever angry with people, it's like this. You can read this in other parts of the Bible where it equates the anger and the hatred that seeps into our heart to being like killing people. It's really heavy. That's what it's like. And many of us, we can look at other people who do that and stuff. It's quite easy to ignore what goes on in our own hearts. Again, anyone who says, um, again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. Sweet. I read this part. I'm like, awesome. I haven't raka in like at least a month. 2024, Raka free, right? Anybody else? Yeah. <laughs> haven't done it. So I'm safe on that one. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. I'll unpack that a little bit. Um, Jesus says, Raka is the court, and you fool is worse. It's like the danger of the fire of hell. What those, those terms actually have, like, some specific meanings to them. So Raka is this Aramaic term, and what it means is, like, empty-headed. Like, you, you, your brain left the building kind of thing. You don't have anything going on up there. 
basically you're an idiot, you're a moron, you're stupid. Um, that's the type of language it is. And it's, it's an attack on someone's like aptitude or intelligence or whatever. So it's going to someone and saying, it's like your head is empty. Jesus is saying, you will be answerable to the court. That's actually not entirely true in Jesus' day. They had a court, a religious court called the Sanhedrin, and they would regularly not, um, would regularly not hold people accountable for this kind of language. Again, I think Jesus is saying, you should. How often do we excuse that in the church, especially if we're talking about people that we think are dumb or that we, if we collectively don't like someone, maybe some church, it's Justin Trudeau that it's okay to say Raka about. Maybe some churches, it's Pierre Polyev that it's okay to say. Maybe it's truckers. Maybe it's people who wave Canadian flags or wave flags with not nice things said about our prime minister. Maybe it's people who have certain views or like certain things or into certain things that collectively we discover it's okay for us to say they're dumb. And the church should be a place, a, like a court, that actually would hold us accountable and say, it's not okay to talk about people like that. You can disagree, but to just say, ah, oh, that person's stupid, that person's an idiot. There's nothing inside their head. But there's some language that Jesus outlines is worse here. He says, anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. The original language that you fool, if raka is to say your head is empty, you fool is to say that your heart is empty. It's actually a judgment on someone's spiritual well-being and their state of, of relationship with God. Now, as the church, this is tricky. There's tension because we should hold each other accountable and at a point should make judgment calls and say, hey, you know what? Like, I, I noticed this thing that is going on in your world. I want to ch lovingly challenge you. What Jesus is calling out is those condescend that, that condescension that creeps into our hearts where we know that if someone wears a mask or doesn't wear a mask a few years ago, we know if they love Jesus truly or not, you know? Or we know if someone's like this or they do this thing or if they cheer for that sports team or whatever it is. We can tell, oh, that person is empty-hearted. That person is a godless one. You fool. Basically, Jesus is saying, yeah, like we'll see later on all throughout Scripture, hold one another accountable in love. But being judgmental people who just look at people with condescension, Jesus compares to first-degree murder. How good are we at justifying and like figuring out why we've made mistakes, right? It's like, when we mess up, we can be like, well, these circumstances were going on. I was quite tired. Uh, you know, like the, I had these pressures in life. But when someone else messes up or tweets the wrong thing or we see an Instagram reel telling us what we should think about them, we judge their character right away. We look at ourselves through circumstances and we judge others through as, as part of their character. And I think Jesus would say that should stop recognizing that we all have circumstances that we go through and all of us have character flaws that we're working through. And rather than being a condescending person who says, you empty-headed or you empty-hearted person, that we should use love to build one another up. As we look at the Old Testament law throughout the Bible, um, many people don't look at it. Many people in the church today are like, yeah, I like the New Testament, the Old Testament. I mean, arguably some parts are pretty tough read, but it's like, I actually worked at a church one time where there was a pastor, and he actually had a master's degree from a seminary, who said, one time said, uh, the Old Testament is salvation by works, and the New Testament is salvation by grace. I was quite appalled to hear a pastor say this, and it led to like a hopefully loving discourse. It was like, man, I don't think that's what it is. All of scripture, what it is, is it's putting God's character on display. In the Old Testament, when God says, don't murder, it's not a checklist where he says, oh, if you don't murder, you like this. It says don't murder because God is expressing his character. He's not a murderous God because he's a loving and kind God. Don't steal because God, not because God just wouldn't steal, but because he's a generous and giving God. Tell don't lie, not just because God wouldn't lie, but because God is a truthful God full of integrity. And so the invitation, again, isn't to just try to hear the words that are said, okay, don't murder, don't say raka, don't say fool, and do these things, but and not to just listen to the words that are being said, but listen to the word who is speaking and to want to be like him rather than just do the things that he said. So Jesus again, he said, you've heard that murder is bad. You guys know that, but I'm telling you, you shouldn't let any of this hatred come out of you. Um, do any of you have a friend or a family member who owns, it's what I call a broken cat. Um, and I'll explain what I mean. 
and no, you might be one of these people, and like, it's no offense. This is, you know, stand by my opinion. If you're going to own a cat, if you're going to go to the trouble, the financial expense, it should be a cat that snuggles with you and purrs lovingly when you pet it. But some people own cats that are really mean and cruel and swat at you and bite at you. Someone in here has one of those, and they're like, oh. But whatever, you can sick your cat on me. I had friends. I had friends who had one of these, and I never, it was, it was like destroying their house. Like every, I was like, guys, like just, I don't know, like you eat animals for other meals, like why not? Yeah. But anyways, I don't know if that's a lot. It was funny though, because I remember this cat, actually my friend's uh, cat, its name was Mike Wazowski for Monsters Inc., which <laughs> makes sense because it's a monster. But this cat would like, swat at you or like run up and bite you or something. And my friend would like laugh and everyone would laugh if someone got, you, well, everyone would laugh except the person who got bit, but we'd always say, hey, you got bit, you got scratched, sometimes a little bit of blood or whatever. And we thought it was funny, but it's actually not funny at all because what that is, is that's a cat that's just too small to eat you, right? <laughs> if it was the size of a lion, uh, it just ate your arm, right? Like. <laughs> It's too small for us to be alarmed by it, but it's actually quite dangerous. It's actually like this. Now, hear me on my object lesson, because I don't know much about horticulture or anything like that, but this is a plant. Yeah, I think I've done that correctly. This is a potted plant. And it's growing healthily, and it's you know doing the things that plants do, photosynthesizing and all that, and it, it's at work. Now, this over here, I'll put a few in here because it's hard to get. It's going to be really hard to see, but this is a seed. It's a seed. Are these two things, besides the pot, are these two things different? Not really. It's just time and maturity, right? Like this, this is just like the future of this, kind of the ghost of Christmas future of this seed, right? It's like this is what this becomes. Many of us in the church, we have our list of acceptable sins and unacceptable sins. I think all of us would probably, if we filled out a poll, would say murder isn't, isn't great. You shouldn't do that. But then it would start to, if we start to like dig down deep, it's like, well, what about anger? What about frustration? What about bitterness? What about jealousy? What about looking down on people or judging people? We're pretty good at justifying gossip and condescension in the church sometimes. Well, yeah, you know, I know that, but like, you know, in this particular instance, in this particular instance, in this particular instance, I think the reason Jesus hammers on this so hard is because the things that we often justify are this. That this is pretty easy to ignore. This is pretty easy to get by. You can sneak this through the door of the church building pretty easily. And when it's like this, maybe it doesn't seem that alarming. But when you think that this little thing is actually the same as this, it's just grown into maturity, you start to realize, well, this is, this is equivalent to that. Jesus isn't just equating it because he just wants us to be better. He's equating it because it's the same thing. Josh, when he spoke about the Israel and Palestine thing, brave topic, uh, but when he spoke about that, he, he said this interesting thing. He's like, you know, terrorists or people who grow up to do evil things once were a small child. They were cute. And I didn't meet Hitler when he was a baby, but I'm assuming he was probably just like his cute as any kid, plus maybe that weird mustache, but like he's probably as cute as any little child. And we look at Hitler like, oh, I would never. I actually think all of us are capable of all the same things. And all of us have these little seeds of sinfulness in us. Like they start in our lives. Like it's so astounding to me how my daughters, like as one, two, three, will just like react, but like out of anger and and hatred and animosity sometimes. It's like, without even being taught how to do that. When these seeds go unchecked, they become something bigger. James describes it like this. He says that when your evil desires like entice you, they're like these seeds that are planted and when they take root and they bloom, that's, that's when like they become truly sinful. I think Jesus equates this because hatred and murder aren't different. It's just all of us who harbor bitterness and anger in us. 
have to recognize that we're capable of this. If that goes unchecked, if we continue to make those deposits, if we fertilize that, if we water that, if we, in our church community, justify it with one another and are encouraged in that, it's like, oh yeah, you're okay to dislike your ex and all that. The scary thing is that all of us can become this. Now this is a nice looking plant, so maybe it's a bad object lesson. Also, this seed is not the right seed. I just bought it at Superstore, but my object lessons all break down. But check yourself. Man, this is a really convicting thing for me because I, I can get easily frustrated with people. Oh, it's easy for me to be like, well, I know I'm frustrated, but they, but they, but they. And Jesus would say, but, but this. Don't let it blossom. Don't let it take root. Jesus continues on. He says, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar. Now, for those of you who don't know what that means, offering your gift at your altar, I'll just let you know. It's my birthday's on March 18th, so it's the Sunday <laughs> around March 18th. Christmas, where I'm up here and you bring gifts here. and you know. It's this important time of like ceremonial worship in Jewish culture. If you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. It's a really specific situation. None of us are ever offering our gift at the altar and have to do that. What Jesus is suggesting here is he's saying, think of the most important thing you could be doing. I would argue that probably in first century Jewish culture, if you were to say, what's like the worst thing you could interrupt? Would it be like your wedding ceremony or offering your gift at the altar? For us, that'd be a no-brainer in 2024, right? Because our parents just spent like $50,000 on the wedding or whatever. But it's like, it would be the wedding. But back then, it would probably be the ceremonial act of worship. They'd be like, well, what worst thing could you mess with? What worst thing could you interrupt? Jesus is using a really heightened example. He says, I don't care what you're doing. It could be the most important thing you're doing. It could be the job interview you've been trying to land for years and years and years. It could be your wedding day. It could be anything. Anything could be going on. And if all of a sudden you realize there's a lack of reconciliation and brokenness in your relationships, now is the time to go deal with it. Can we kick the can down the road pretty well? I, I think the modern church has a lot of, great things about it. I think one of the real weaknesses is the ability to deal with conflict. We, especially in Canada, man, we've just become, oh, we want to avoid that and be polite. And we kick the can of conflict so far down the road and it has such a negative effect on relationships. Jesus says, go, just leave your gift, stop, pause, quit. Whatever you're doing now is the time for reconciliation. Think about this. What's more important of a moment? You offering your gift at the altar or Jesus running the entire universe from his heavenly throne. I think that. And Jesus paused that and interrupted that to come to an unreconciled, broken world where the relationship is broken and said, I am going, even though it's not on him, even though it's not his issue, it's not his problem, he comes and he says, right now I'm going to pause everything I have and come and bring reconciliation. Who does Jesus say the responsibility is here? He says, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, it's actually unclear and I think it's intentionally ambiguous. Because often we're like, well, you know, they're the one that messed up or, you know, I leave. Stop. Just go try. Go reconcile. If it's 100% your fault, 100% their fault, any mix in between, go. Because reconciliation is at the heart of the gospel. The whole story of this book is is a race of people, not like race in that way, but like the human race, turning away from God, breaking the relationship and God doing everything he can right now as soon as possible in the moment to bring reconciliation and healing to a broken relationship. When you pursue reconciliation, you're not only following in the way of Jesus, but you're enacting and incarnating the truth and the power of the gospel in your life. You are bringing kingdom come to this planet when you pursue reconciliation. Is it uncomfortable? For sure. Does it always work? Often it doesn't. There are, many situations, there are many situations in my life where I've tried to pursue reconciliation. It hasn't worked. I can't fix that. But in Romans 12, Paul says, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So that you could say, you know what? There is some brokenness, but I've done everything I can, or I've left my heart in an open posture toward reconciliation. Jesus continues this idea with a very like too specific to not have happened example. He says, settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still together on the way or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you've paid the last penny. If you don't know what a penny is, it's something we used to have in Canada. Um, 
This is a really specific example. I think what Jesus is saying there is he's saying they're real, like, beyond his commandments, his teaching, and existing within the love that he has to offer the world, there's some real practical reasons why reconciliation is important. Do it while you're still on the way to the court. Like, do it now. Like, just, just get into it. Have the messy, challenging conversation. If it's too hard for you, bring a friend in or bring someone in who can help you do that. Otherwise, man, you're going to see, the, like, the judge, the officer, and you get thrown into prison, and it will mess you up. I think relational brokenness is a bigger deal than getting thrown into p- prison and having to pay back a debt. And I think Jesus would argue that as well. He's saying this causes real issues, especially the longer you put it off. I just was helping and kind of sitting in on a mediation process um, between some people. But it's taken, it took so long for this mediation process to begin and for us to get in the room together. Almost two years since kind of the incidents in question. And, and these are between church people. Two years out, who even knows what happened, right? Anybody ever been in a conflict? And like, all, at one point you're like, what are we fighting about again? You have to sit there and think for a while. And then, like this, it sounds ridiculous. I've done, like, I've done this with my wife. Where I'm like, what am I upset about? And I sit there for a while. I think about, I'm like, okay, yeah, that. And I like remind myself to like hold on to the conflict or the frustration or the anger. At two years out, it's like listening to these people talk. It's like, I, I don't know if anybody has any idea what's actually gone wrong. Jesus says, hop into it now. So here are two mantras I pull from this that I carry with me, and maybe they'll be helpful to you. The first one is this, and it's a nice rhyme. It says, don't wait a while, reconcile. Don't wait a while, reconcile. Don't wait a while, reconcile. Again, all your Canadian politeness, all your like, should I, shouldn't I, all the advice from people, all the best counselors in the world, it's all great. And then you come to Jesus who just says, even if you're offering your gift at the altar, even if you're walking to court with these people, no matter what's going on, hit pause and prioritize reconciliation above everything else. Prioritize reconciliation. Jesus did that when he came and gave his life. Don't wait a while, reconcile. So ask yourself sometime when there's conflict, maybe, maybe during our, our communion time in a moment here, maybe as, as you think about this God who paused everything to like pursue reconciliation in our world, Maybe I say, God, are, are there some areas in my life, are there some relationships or some people where it seems impossible, but I haven't made my best loving efforts to go and pursue reconciliation? And listen, that means, that means letting go of some things. Romans 5 says, while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. He didn't like wait and around a mediation table. He's like, okay, hey, own everything you can. Like, you got to admit everything and say everything you're wrong about. And all. he just, he came and he said, I... I just care more about reconciliation. I had a conversation with someone at one point in my life where some stuff had gone on and eventually I just had to come to them and say, listen, like, I actually just, I, I just can't care about that anymore. I have to care about the short time on life, uh, the short time we have on this planet together and prioritize what Jesus is saying here. Don't wait a while, reconcile. So maybe during communion, God will bring something to your heart where you're like, yeah, you know what? When I think about Jesus, who stopped at nothing to pursue reconciliation, he didn't wait a while. He brought this in my life just when I needed it. Maybe there's an area of your life for that as well. And the other one is this. It's hate deals damage, love heals damage. Again, I don't think many of us probably think of ourselves as hateful people. Um, Many times in our culture, if you say the word hate, people say, oh, hate's a strong word. I actually think the opposite. I think hate's a really weak word. Uh, It takes a lot of strength to love your adversaries. It takes a lot of strength to love people when they're awful to you. It takes a lot of strength for Jesus to crawl up on a cross and die for sinners and to to offer forgiveness to the people pounding the cross. It takes a lot of strength to love people in the middle of relational conflicts. Hate, that's the easy thing. That's, That's the simple work. That's light work. Like that is really easy to do. Love it's a real challenge. I'm actually, when we had our first daughter like six years ago, um, my wife and I quickly realized uh, 
we became more aware of the words coming out of our mouths. Now, I don't want to make it sound like we're some big potty mouths or something like that, but just some of the words, some of the language we used, we're like, you know what? Are these like the first words we want our daughter learning? Do we want her to be the ones that, inter- again, like don't, don't take your imaginations too far, okay? We love you. But just simple words. One of them was hate. I hate that. Oh, I hate it when this happens. Oh, I hate to say it, but we say if you actually start thinking about that word and you and you just listen, it's crazy how much the word hate gets said all the time by almost everybody. And I'm not here to tell you if you say the word hate, that's like a common vernacular that you're a sinner or something like that. But it's astounding how like common a verbiage that is in our world. And in our family, we, we don't use that word. So we've, our daughter will say it or something. We're like, you can't. She's like, everyone at school says it. And it's like, yeah, it's okay, cool. Like, they're, you know, you won't be with them in eternity. No, it's okay. Uh, but <laughs> we're better. They're a bunch of empty-hearted fools. No, it's okay. Man, hate creeps in in so many ways. Bitterness, frustration, and we can justify it so easily. I think what Jesus would say is, if a relationship is broken, if there's any kind of tension... You can look at what the other person's done, and that's usually an act of hatred, or else you can really lean into what you've done. Because in conflict and intention in relationships, you know, there isn't a lot of neutral ground where you often either like those construction workers who are building things and growing things and healing things, or we're like a demolition worker who's tearing things down and breaking things down and all of that. I think in the kingdom of Jesus, Jesus often uses this fairly binary thing where he, he kind of says, like, you're for me or you're, you're against me. You're on the narrow path or on the broad path. He kind of, one or the other. And so he would say, would you take the, the path of love or would you take the path that is devoid of love? And you can call it anger, bitterness, frustration, jealousy, dissent, division, hatred, whatever, hostile disagreement, anything, indifference, whatever word you want there. And in the church, we all get to choose. Do I want to be someone who deals damage or heals damage? Hate deals damage. Love deals damage. I know in my life, I've caused a lot of pain. I know in my life, I've hurt people. I've caused frustration and all that. And I want to be more like that preacher on the mount. I want to be more like Jesus who just looks past it and says, how can I love well? How can I pursue reconciliation in these relationships? I'm going to call the communion servers uh, forward. Um, been a little bit sick overnight, so I'm not going to break the bread, which is also great because if you've watched me struggle breaking the bread in the past, it's a really nice week off for me. Jesus here uses the example of murder. Don't kill people. 